Hey there, I love our jaunty intro music. Welcome to the second edition of First Friday's Conversations with Archivists. This is produced by the Martha Blakeley Hodges Special Collections and University Archives, which is part of the University Libraries at UNC Greensboro. Uh, just for you a heads up, this pre these presentations are recorded and then later posted to our channel on YouTube. Uh, Patrick will be putting the link to that channel in the chat. So uh, catch up on ones you've missed, relive ones that you just want again. My name is Beth Ann Kelsch. I'm the curator of the Women Veterans Historical Project, and I'm the host of these series of discussions about collections, campus, and community. Today, we're featuring my fellow archivists, Suzanne Sawyer and Sean Mulligan, and they're going to speak about their experiences working with military related materials in our collections, which is not Women Veterans Historical Project collections. So a we'll, little, uh, little surprise there. So we're gonna do any um, questions, answers that or we call that Q and A in the biz after the presentation. So uh, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box and Suzanne and Sean will um, answer them at the end. So. We are happy to have everyone here today. Suzanne is going to be preventing, presenting first. So Suzanne, please, the floor is yours. All right, can you hear me okay? I can. Great, let me share my screen here. Can you see my presentation? Yes, yes, I can. Okay, great. So the item I'm gonna be discussing today is an unknown World War I officer's um, diary of the Western Front in France. Um, the bound diary um, traces the events, actually, excuse me one second here. Um, the bound diary traces the events of April 18, 1918 to April 1919. And the officer describes such events as deploying from Camp Merritt in New Jersey, um, sailing to Liverpool, England, and eventually where he was stationed in various locations in France. Um, and of particular significance or interest to me was his account of the events of November 11th, 1918, when a ceasefire was declared and the war was over. Um, but I'll come back to that a little bit later. So Bill Finley, um, former department head of special collections and university archives, purchased this diary for our collections in January of 2011. Um, and I suspect he wasn't just interested in the historical significance of a you know, first person's view of World War I, um, but also that the diary begins in Charlotte, North Carolina. And unfortunately, we don't know if this particular officer who wrote the diary is from North Carolina, but our story begins here at least, and the first entry in his journal is, um, begins in Charlotte. So despite not knowing all the details of the identity of the officer who wrote the diary, um, we do get to read his description of these events of World War I as he experienced them. So talk about a primary source. Um, this diary gives UNCG students and researchers studying World War I an opportunity to view a first person history um, and what it was like on the Western Front in 1918. The diary was bound in a faux leather cover and has gold gilded edges on the text block. The diary pages overall are in good condition, except what you see there on the right. Those are the back couple of pages there are pretty soiled um, and tattered. Uh, the remaining front cover is worn, um, especially on the fore edge where it um, would have been handled to open the cover, but the spine and back cover are missing if I didn't say that. So it's about four and a half inches wide and five and three quarter inches tall. So it's really small, easily tucked into a pocket or in the case of this World War I soldier, um, small enough to be tucked in a canvas sack um, called a bread bag that World War I soldiers often carried. Is 365 pages, one for each day of the year, um, with just over 300 of the pages utilized by the author. And this type of diary was formatted for the author to be able to record a line a day for five years. Um, so you can see in that right image, the 19s that go um, down the left side of that page, and that's so that he can write in the year for each of his entries. Um, however, he didn't really in his diary adhere to that format very much. As you can see in this entry, he blends for, um, over the course of two years. Um, but as I mentioned, the diary traces his experiences from April 1918 to 1919. So there is a little bit of overlap as he gets um, to April 1919. 
I was immediately drawn into kind of the minutia of the author's days um, that he wrote about, uh, things like inspections, training, what he ate, where he was, and how he passed the time. And I kept coming across this game that he mentioned called Red Dog. Um, he talks about playing it with other folks a lot. So I wasn't really familiar with the game, so I looked it up online. And it turns out it's a card game. It's a game of chance, which you all may already know what it is. I didn't, I'm not a big game person, um, but it, it was just a game of chance. So probably a pretty mindless way to pass the time because it didn't involve any kind of strategy or skill per se. So playing cards, of course, um, was popular, a popular pastime, not just with American World War I soldiers, but with soldiers from any different country or um, any different war, really, because they're so portable and it's a great way to pass the time as they're waiting on the next thing, the next battle, the next order to ship out and that kind of thing. So the picker, the image on the left there are Canadian soldiers during World War I playing cards. Don't know if they're playing Red Dog, though. But I mention all of that um, because it's those sort of rabbit holes of looking up a card game or interesting little facts like that. That's what I enjoy most about working in manuscripts, researching the details of an item in order to kind of provide context for researchers or just an interesting fact um, or details in the finding aid. So the finding aid, for those of you that don't know, uh, needs to include a description of the scope and contents of the collection. In this case, the collection is one single item. Um, but that's so that a researcher has enough information by reading the finding aid to know if it could be useful for their research. So often we have items or collections that we don't know that much about the creator. So it's like kind of solving a puzzle as we look for clues. Um, and that's kind of the case here. We don't know who the officer is who wrote this journal. So it might be somewhat time consuming, but it probably would be possible to identify the author if, with some deeper research. Um, we know several clues from the diary that he shared, such as which infantry regiment he was in, um, who some of his commanding officers were, and that he served as an adjutant. He was an assistant to a commanding officer until he was promoted to uh, captain on October 7th, 1918. We know that his birthday was uh, September 20th because he mentions it in an entry, but he didn't mention his age, so we don't know the year he was born. So there are plenty of clues that we could sort of follow to figure out who he is. Um, and kind of as a side note, uh, I've found in my limited experience of tracking down details of someone's life that obituaries, uh, online obituaries, often help me sort through not just birth and death dates, um, but also connections between people, chronology of events, and the geography of a person's life. Unfortunately, in this case, I don't know his name, so that's not very helpful, but I have found that a helpful tool for other things when I'm looking for something about an author. So as I mentioned earlier, the diary begins in Charlotte, North Carolina, and in that first entry, the author was talking about breaking camp and boarding a train to Jersey City and Camp Merritt in uh, April of 1919. Camp Merritt was named for Civil War, War Journal Wesley Merritt and um, is, was the U.S. Army's largest staging area for soldiers bound for French and Belgian battlefields. About 570,000 men, including a young captain named Harry S. Truman, passed through Camp Merritt. Soldiers would spend a few days to a week there um, before traveling by train to Hoboken, New Jersey to ship out. For many of the soldiers traveling with our diarist, this would be their first time heading to battle. They had trained and drilled incessantly since entering the army. And in one entry written a few days into their sea voyage, the author wrote, while eating dinner, the guns opened up. Great excitement in the room, but no real signs of panic. Captain and I called it gun practice and held people steady. Proved to be either a whale or an upturned boat and a number of shots were fired. Many nervous ones aboard. That entry kind of provides the reader with a glimpse into the mood on the ship, sort of the, the anxiety among the enlisted men, uh, the officer's desire to keep calm despite the unknown, and the readiness and kind of fear of what's ahead. So the boat eventually docked in Liverpool, England, and soldiers made their way to Bar sur Aube. Um, forgive my French pronunciations from here on out, um, in which uh, they continue to train for battle. And in this image here, um, American soldiers are receiving training on a machine gun from a British uh, instructor in France. And this picture was taken in May 1919, around the time our officer would have been uh, receiving similar training. 
So possibly an insignificant fact, um, but at first I was really surprised how often I came across the author mentioned, mentioned that he was drinking champagne. For example, in one entry he wrote, went up to town in PM with Ruff and Thomas, had some champagne, returned to barracks and started to go to bed, but we got thirsty again and we went up to town and had a champagne party. In other entries, he talks about drinking a lot of champagne and having a, quote, real party. So infer what you will about real party. I had some ideas, but um, it was just kind of interesting how often I came across it. But in talking to Kathleen Smith, interim department head of special collections and university archives, she reminded me that where he's stationed or where he was stationed was in that northeastern section of France where champagne is made. So um, I know you won't be able to read place names in that map on the right, but the yellow stars denote some of the places where he was stationed. And referencing that map on the left, you can see that he was definitely in champagne country. So champagne was likely abundant and as you know, when in Rome. So this sort of detail may not be of particular historical significance, but it does provide a really relatable experience for our students um, to understand kind of the humanity of this, of this soldier from so long ago. So there are, of course, many more serious entries in, that the author reports on, such as shelling or near misses during battle. He talks about the loss of other soldiers or scouting new locations. Um, in this entry, Tuesday, August 6, rain all day, did not leave dugout except for meals, artillery on both sides sending them over, but no damage here. And sometimes it's what isn't in the diary that becomes important. For instance, most of October 1918 is blank. There are very few entries in that month. And I later learned in reading a history of the fifth division, this officer's division, that that month of October 1918 is um, when they underwent some of the toughest fighting of the entire war. So it's likely there wasn't any time for scratching down just a line a day even because he was just trying to stay alive. But I was stopped in my tracks when I got to this particular entry on November 11th, 1918. All guns ceased fire at 11 a.m. and war is over. Much excitement and joy among the men. Moved all my company up to Charmois Chateau, then got order releasing us from duty with the infantry. So took company back into the town of Leon de Vendune. I left my hand in this image on the left um, to demonstrate what this sort of resource means for our students and other researchers. They can quite literally touch history. I was curious about the places that he mentioned in this November 11th entry, kind of where was the officer when he learned the war was over? How far was that from the chateau he mentions? And then he marches even further down into the town of, of Leon de Vendune. So I looked some of those things up. So at first I had trouble deciphering what his handwriting said about the name of the chateau, but finally figured it out that it was Charmois. Um, and again, my French pronunciations are not good. Um, the last location that he mentioned before that day was Ancreville, um, which is probably where he was or close to that area during the, his last bit of action or fighting. So upon learning that the war was over, he took his men to Charmois Chateau, then the order released them from duty. So they went into the town of Leon de Vendune. And altogether, um, I mapped out, it was probably about 12 or 13 miles. Um, I'm sure he probably cut some corners through fields and so forth, but it's quite a hike still nonetheless. Um, the two arrows that you see on the map, um, the yellow arrows are pointing to the border of France and Belgium. So you can see how close he was to the front. And in the yellow box at the bottom there, um, that's Ancreville. I know it's really small, but Ancreville in the bottom left. And then the blue line traces up to Chateau de Charmois and then Leon de Vendune where they were. So one really interesting fact about Leon de Vendune, when I looked it up, um, I learned that there's a monument there marking the most advanced command post of the 5th American Division. So that's probably where our officer was heading was to that command post. So about 104 years later, I went online to find this monument for his division at the place he mentions in his diary, where he no doubt walked really close to that spot during World War I. So just kind of a neat connection to history. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Sean, who will be talking about some Civil War materials in our collections. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, so I'll tell you when So go ahead, next slide. This is really weird. Uh, so uh, I'm going to be talking about the David Hosmer collection that we recently acquired. 
It's a rather small collection and it contains about 60 pieces of correspondence that span the years from 1862 to uh, 1894, but the majority of the material is from 1862 to 1863. Um, and so the letters revolve around David Hosmer and his family. And so Davis was just 17 years old when in September of 1862, he left his family and his farm in Farmington, Massachusetts to join the Union Army. And he enlisted into the Company F of the 45th Massachusetts Volunteer Militia. Um, and so he would be stationed there in Massachusetts until November of 62, 1862, when his regiment would board a ship and head south to New Bern, North Carolina. Next. Sorry. Oh, forward. Yep, there you go. Oh. Yep. Nah, there you go. So. Sorry, there. Um, so I say that, this, this slide points out that on the muster roll, it lists him as 18 years old. However, we know from facts and uh, that he's actually only 17 at the time. So whether he lied or there's just a mistake in the recording and the documentation, we don't know. But I just find it interesting to note that he was listed as an 18 year old, but in reality, he was only 17. Next. Awesome. Um, so Davis would see two combat engagements during his service. Both were in North Carolina. So he was at the Battle of Kensington on December 14th, 1862, and also in the Battle of Whitehall in December 16, 1862. Um, and so this is one of the letters we have that he wrote home to his parents. Uh, you see he misspelled Kensington, um, but he does know there at the top, he says, I tell you, I'm not hurt by the rebels, uh, but there were 14 killed and 55 wounded. Um, next slide. Unfortunately, uh, Davis did not live to see the end of the war. He uh, succumbed to typhoid fever in February of 1863. Uh, and he died in a hospital at Newborn, or New Bern, uh, North Carolina. Um, but he's actually, his body was recovered and sent back home to his parents, and he was buried up in Farmington, Massachusetts. Next slide. <laughs> so uh, this collection contains Davis's short but eventful experience in the Civil War. Uh, and this is what's been documented. And so it contains a lot of letters that Davis wrote home to his parents, his siblings, uncles, aunts, cousins, and friends. Uh, and there's also correspondence written back to him about, uh, between, and also correspondence between the family members. So we get two examples here. Jane was his, uh, his sister, and obviously his uh, friend was writing to him. And you know there, I don't know, the date, um, it's February 5th and 63. So on uh, the next slide. Uh -huh. uh, so the subject of these letters convey the difficult reality that soldiers and families face during the war. Uh, there's also then references to death, religion, perception, or, uh, perceptions of the war, uh, as well as discussions about everyday life in camp and at home. They also speak of missing each other and wishing that this wicked war would end and soon be over. Uh, unfortunately, they had no idea at the time that the war would last for another two and a half years um, before it was over. Next slide. So there's also a diary contained in this collection, uh, and it can recount his daily actions during the service. Now, it's not a very extensive diary compared to other civil war diaries. It's very, um, there's a lot of description to it, but you can see that he noted on various days what he was doing. Um, so like on January 3rd, he noted, I bought a pistol. Uh, and also documents the time when he didn't feel good. So there are some times in there where it says in December, you know, diarrhea and not feeling well. So no appetite. So it was very simplistic diary, but again, it gives you a perspective as to what he was going through during his service. Next slide. Uh, we also see a random drawing character turn that was also included in this collection. Um, I'm not really sure what the meaning was or why it was sent to him, but obviously his friends and him were kind of joking. So it's kind of interesting to see some type of humor as well in, in these uh, correspondence between friends and family. All right, next slide. So why do we add this collection to our archives? Well, one is that we don't really have a lot of civil related materials in our collection. Uh, other institutions like Chapel Hill have a significant amount in their Southern Historical Collection, but we don't have one here. We thought it would be a great opportunity to um, engage the UNCG community and the students and other faculty and professors on campus to sort of get them interested in this topic as well and give them a chance to work firsthand with some of the uh, archival material. In addition, it was sort of unique that we got material related to North Carolina in the Civil War. So as most people probably know, a lot of the battles took place in Virginia or out in the Western Theater, and they weren't really focused heavily in North Carolina. 
Now, North Carolina did have a lot of engagement and connection to the Civil War. They provided almost 130,000 men to the Confederate cause, but we don't have a lot of uh, actual engagement. So to get these kind of documents that talk about that is really unique and rare. It was kind of a great addition to add, to have a connection to North Carolina history um, in our archives. Next. So some of the challenges with this collection, the first one was cursive. Um, I got some examples on there. See if you can figure out what they're actually saying on there. Um, so we take for granted today how easy it is to read everything. It's all in print. There's no questions of whether it's an I or a T. You just can read it. But in the case of many of these Civil War letters, penmanship varied, and it became very difficult at times to read what they were writing about. Um, some are very easy, like the one on the bottom, perhaps a, a letter might be uh, acceptable, but then the one on the top, eh, it, took, it takes a while, and it kind of gives you a headache sometimes trying to decipher what they're saying. Um, and sometimes the words they're using are not very common to 20th century words. You know, they're words that were relevant back then in 1800s. So you sometimes get that challenge of what, it's almost like a foreign language at times. Uh, next. And sometimes there's, given the limited resources, paper wasn't wasted. A lot of times they would finish at the bottom of the page and then the curve to the right, go up to the, the margins, back over, of course, across the top. Uh, and so this was this example stood out to me where they finished writing the bottom, turned to the side, kept writing again, and continued to write over the other writing. So you now have cross crossing cursive handwriting, and you're trying to read these letters to see like what, what are they saying? Um, so that became sort of a challenge to really, you know, understand it. And not all, and so one of the things is someone who comes to research. If they're not well versed in cursive, as maybe some young scholars and historians might be, it can be challenging to know what is being written um, and being said. You know, it is the way I refer to it as a foreign language because cursive is a language all into its own. Um, so next slide. So along with challenges of cursive and handwriting, um, there was a the question of like, who were these people? And as I you know, started going through this collection, I knew David Hosmer, obviously that was the name of the title, but then it was like, who was he writing to? Who's writing to him? Well, where's friends? And I got very lucky just through the sheer chance of Googling his name to find that someone in his family had done a genealogical in-depth research on the Hosmer family. Uh, and that proved invaluable. Going through that allowed me to kind of piece together all the characters that are involved in this collection. Um, and you can see there, I put in the arrow, that's Nathan Davis Hosmer, who was born uh, in 1845, and that was his dad. And it lists the siblings of him, and then went on from there to list who was his dad's relatives, who was his dad's dad, who were the people who married into the family, and all that really opened the door to understand when they mention names or when they assign their name Samuel Hayes or assign their name Jane, that's his sister. And knowing all that really was insightful to kind of piece together this mystery puzzle of who was who. And it kind of allowed me to get a better sense of what was going on and kind of see how the relationships, you know, connected and who was writing and who was experiencing in the home front, who was other serving this war and other times. Um, so it's just kind of really interesting and very lucky to find that in-depth research that someone had done about this family. Um, all right, next slide. So what I really love about this collection is that it illustrates many, it's sort of like a micro, microcosm of the Civil War and that it covers a lot of the themes that scholars like to research on. Um, and one of them I've kind of picked up on was that the cruel nature of war. You know, we talk about, there's a lot of research about the Civil War and its, and its brutality. But then also you kind of get the sense of what I, I term the universality of the human experience. Uh, next slide. So on one side of the pieces of correspondence in this collection, it acknowledges the brutality and the terrible actions that occurred in the war. So we see firsthand in a letter from one of Davis's friends, Iris Onthank, uh, who was also serving in the Union Regiment, another Union Regiment. And so he wrote to Davis about how his unit was traveling south through Maryland which at the time was part of the Union, but was considered a border state because it also had slavery uh, as, at the time, technically. And so he writes to him that as they're traveling south to DC, they got word of a local man who was a Southern sympathizer. And in this letter, he's referred to as a sesh up there, which I had to look up because again, that kind of term wasn't common to me. 
Uh, and they know that they took it upon themselves to make a detour to this man's farm. And he writes, so he had a little fun, in quotes. And he goes on to describe the slaughtering of his livestock and the burning of his house. Um, and so, you know, you kind of get that, that was war. And they were really anti, you know, Southern sympathizers. And then in another letter, we learn about the dreadful conditions that one of Davis's uncles suffered when he was taken prisoner of war. Uh, he writes to his brother, which was actually Davis's dad, uh, that the soldier's life is very hard. I and mean, it came so near to starving us that it was enough to make anyone sick. For five days, we had nothing to eat. Of course, they being the rebels and the Confederacy. Uh, and the letter actually goes on to describe how it wasn't that the Confederates were being horrible to the prisoners. It was that the Confederates themselves did not have food. It was a very tough time. And they themselves were scrounging to get substance as well as for the soldiers. I mean, sorry, for the prisoners of war. Right, next slide. But then in contrast to these horrible actions is also the universality of the human experience and emotions. This collection is about a 70 year old son riding home to his parents, being away from home for the first time, uh, expressing all that he's going through, uh, and is he, sometimes even asking them to send food and things from home. We have one letter where he writes, you know, I can get heart attack all day long, but it would be lovely if I could get some food or something fresh or something from, from mom, you know, or dad from the home front. Uh, and they actually do send him a box of uh, good materials to him. Um, it's kind of similar to how a college student would be today at 17 years old, writing home to mom saying, you know, we got food here, but we grant you to send stuff for me here. Uh, and also we learn the siblings and the friends who look forward to seeing the days when they can see Davis again. We talk of holidays about not being the same in his absence. And sadly, we see, the, you know, we read about the real struggle of parents when they face the death of their child. Um, there are several pieces of correspondence from Davis's commander, second lieutenant, Theodore Hurd, um, which is on the right there at the bottom, uh, who had to write home to Davis's dad and express his sorrow for his loss and noting how well his son has served and did his duty uh, to his country. And, you know, he writes there, I, I suppose you have by this time received the sad intelligence of the death of your son, Davis and Hosmer. As Dr. Stone, the chaplain of our regiment, told me that he has already written to you. Um, and then also in contrast, or not contrast, but in connection with that, there are sympathetic letters written to the family, such as the one from Armory Hayes, who was Davis's uh, cousin. He wrote to the parents and said, you know, to say that you have my heartfelt sympathy in this irreparable loss you have experienced and the loss of your son. Uh, and also it hit me in a real sur surreal moment when I read the last letter that the parents had written to their son, which was dated January 31st, 1863. And realizing that in that letter, you know, the dad is saying, if you're not feeling good, you should try to come home, get a furlough, come back to us, we can take care of you. And realizing that he, the son, you know, Davis, there obviously probably did not get that letter, that he had died or was infirmed by the time the letter arrived to him, and that he probably never got to read that letter. Um, and so that's kind of what really captivates me about this collection is that the universality of various themes and emotions, you know, it really transcend his circle context. So you know, even though this happened in 1863, over 150 years ago, people can still relate to the emotions of a child being away, like today would be in college, or in the military, or of uh, dealing with the losses of a loved one, or even how war can affect people. And, uh, you know, sadly, today, we are still sort of seeing that played out uh, in current events. Next slide. So, anyway, I can talk about this stuff for hours on end, as most of my colleagues know, but uh, so in short, it's a really great collection. And I look forward to having uh, other researchers come and uh, use archives to do research. And in this last slide, and these actually are material, these were the uniform and satchel bag of Davis Hosmer. Uh, unfortunately, these are not part of our collection. These were sold at auction in uh, 2017. So somewhere in a museum or someone's private collection, they actually have them. But it was unique again to see that these were being sold more uh, some years ago. But there is his uniform. Uh, and there's this thing, so we'd love to have them, but again, they're not part of our collection. I just have the letters in ours, but uh, anyway, I'll be done, and uh, that is my spiel for the Davis Hosmer collection. Uh, thank you, Suzanne and Sean. Um, just we'll write, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box, and we will do our best to answer them. Uh, I, of course, have some comments before, while we're waiting. The uh, Sean's collection is besides it being a civil war and makes it rare, the fact that it's correspondence, uh, so letters to and from um, the, to Davis is 
is not that common. Usually when we get collections, or I should only speak for my own collections, uh, it's just one-sided, you know, because if I'm donating, it's what I have, and I certainly are I'm not going to have the letters that I wrote. So it's always fascinating to try to read letters, you know, um, in which the correspondent is answering a question that was, you know, in their le the letter to them that you have no idea what it is. And the other thing that I love uh, about this is, you know, this presentation brings out how, you know, even though as archivists, we're dealing with, you know, material from, you know, hundreds of years ago, the internet is our best friend in terms of, um, you know, especially if you don't know anything about the donor, I mean, all, you know, what Suzanne and Sean found, um, you know, was was through the internet. So it, you know, yay internet. Um, and, you know, we as archivists, you know, try to make um, our collections as accessible as possible. And, you know, and that's just what we do as opposed to the very old days when you needed permission to get into an archive. So, um, you know, if, if an archivist has, a, 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 there's enough resources for a collection, um, you know, please try to get them online. So, okay, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. All right, um, let's see. I answered Terrence, but yes, there is plans to eventually have these digitized at some point in the future so that others can read them. Okay. Um, Yes, and then um, Carolyn pointed out that if you have an accountant, Ancestry, I mean, I use Ancestry a lot, you know, for women veterans, you know, to figure out that their birth date, death dates, you know, if they applied for, you know, uh, government benefits, you can find out where they served. Uh, Suzanne could probably get a lot if she could only figure out the guy's name. That's that's always yeah. a challenge, you know, at least usually people in diaries, you know, at least put their name, but not, not this guy. So he was busy. Yeah. Um, but I see yeah, Patrick's, I mean, sorry, yeah. I saw Patrick put a question in there too about, um, did I find anything else about what happened to the officer oh, after his is. unit? after the war ended. Um, I didn't find anything else about him specifically. Um, I do know that the fifth division that he was part of became part of the army of occupation in Belgium and Luxembourg right after the ceasefire. Um, and then his diary does continue through April of the following year. So at some point in March of that following year, he goes to Paris for a few days. And um, then when he gets back to his unit, he finds out he's being transferred to a different infantry in the 35th division. So the diary ends where he's kind of getting used to that new assignment. And then um, I read somewhere else that the 35th division was apparently demobilized and sent back to the US. And that's kind of where the end of the diary is and also what we know of this particular officer. I think that is a professional risk we have is going down rabbit holes and trying to make ourselves come back up. Like I could spend forever researching this person. So what other questions do we have here? Oh, so um, uh, Suzanne, the, you had mentioned that the spine and the back cover of the diary are, missed, are missing. Um, and since you also do conservation, do you have any plans for that? Um, yeah, actually, so um, we won't probably um, do a lot of intensive repair on this. It might be stabilized a little bit. Um, but then um, either Audrey, our preservation manager, or I will build a box for it so that it can be stored and, and protected. Um, in the cases of something like this, a diary that was handled, a lot of times the, um, the wear and tear on it becomes part of the narrative of the object. Just like if it were a military uniform that had a bullet hole in it, um, even though that could be repaired, you probably wouldn't repair it because that gives the researcher a lot of information that they wouldn't have access to otherwise. So we probably would leave that um, kind of wear and tear on this diary. Um, but it does need um, protecting that um, fore edge of that front cover is pretty um, unstable. So it needs to be stabilized a little bit, but other than that, not much. Okay, oh, I just saw I'm not doing the chat monitoring very well. Maggie pointed out that um, 
through NC Live, we have access to Heritage Quest. So do we have other questions? We have a couple more minutes. I, of course, have questions because I always have questions. Um, so I just wanted to follow up on Terry's question about the Civil War letters being digitized. Uh, since cursive is, you know, what is it, its own language? Um, that's, that's it. Uh, are, are you planning when you digitize them to transcribe them? So. Yes, I believe that is again part of a future project that maybe have a student working on potentially, but somewhere that yes, they would be to us to make them more accessible would have to be transcribed because obviously not every college kid will know how to read in cursive. So that's something that's you know okay. to make more accessibility would need to have them transcribed. Okay. And unless we have uh, we're about to run out of time, did you guys have what were your oh has anything surprised you right with reading through the correspondence? And that's sort of my question too. So I have a, a chill moment of like right. <laughs> well, there's a lot of a lot of things in there, but I mean one thing I I like that kind of stood out to me was so some of the letters after the Emancipation Proclamation that uh, Lincoln had given out in September went to effect in January 1st, 63. Um uh, someone actually referenced in one of the letters, um so I have it. And they wrote, um, yeah, so Samuel Hayes, which was a brother of Davis's dad, was writing to Davis's mom, uh, and he was writing about God's impact on the war and all that. And he kind of randomly quotes in this line, it says, but for an Abraham Lincoln with one stroke of his pen could not have declared that, declared that a military necessity required that all persons held as slaves in rebellious states should be free. I cannot see how a president of these United States could be authorized to make such a proclamation in a time of peace and quiet. So he's sort of justifying saying that while the war is horrible, it gave Lincoln the opportunity to do this wonderful thing. And so that even, you know, so this is sort of a God's willingness to do it. It's just so, so interesting to see kind of reference so clearly and directly in the letters saying this Emancipation Proclamation is a great thing. And, you know, it's part of the God's plan and everything. But definitely, you know, direct commentary on, on big events. Suzanne, did you have a, a goosebump moment? Just that one, I mean, all of it was interesting to me, but the one when I came across the November 11th one, when he's describing the ceasefire, I, I literally gasped when I got to that page just because I was like, oh my gosh, this is the end of the war. And he's actually on this day writing this century. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, these, these are great examples of how archives can, can make history and individuals role in them come alive. So great, that, that's, that's wonderful. I don't see any other questions. I'm gonna give just a few more seconds. Well, you can always email us, um, you know, skua at uncg.edu. Oh, oh, we gotta thank you. Um, Patrick there put in the uh, chat box. So. Thank you all for, for joining us today. Thank you, Sean and Suzanne. Um, look at all those thank yous. Look at all those thank yous. So there we go. So have a great rest of the day and we will see you next first Friday. All right, bye-bye.